Welcome to this first lecture in statistical molecular thermodynamics. So many of you may have been drawn into the course based on the introduction video, which involved me doing a demonstration of the thermite reaction. So I'd like to spend this first video talking a bit about the philosophy of the course, how it's going to be laid out, and also I, I hate to do a demonstration without then providing some information about it afterwards. And I told you that part of the course would involve learning how to do the calculations that would let you yourself uh, determine whether a reaction like the thermite reaction would take place, and if so, would it release a lot of heat, for instance. I think of that as sort of a big picture thermodynamics calculation. And by big picture, if I had to pick some sort of analogy, it would be a big picture like building a house. So uh, a grand project, and at the end, you've got some satisfying outcome uh, predicting properties of a chemical reaction. However, the truth is, this course is designed to be fairly fundamental. So before you can build a house, you've got to build a hammer. And so a fair amount of the course will involve, from first principles, building up the tools that we'll need to understand thermodynamical concepts and then to apply those concepts. Nevertheless, in the first few lectures, we're going to be a little bit light. I'm going to give you a, a sort of a big picture overview of what happened in the thermite reaction. And if you don't follow it perfectly right now, that's fine. I just want to give you a feel for it. And by the end of the course, if you were re to return to that video, uh, you will find, I think, that you understand it perfectly. And that'll be a real goal. So the first two or three videos in the series I'm going to say a bit about why you might want to learn thermodynamics, explain what sorts of things that uh, one can do with it, and then afterwards we'll dive into the building a hammer part. So let me return to thermite, and now I'll show you a balanced chemical equation. And so I told you that we had a little flower pot filled with rust and aluminum powder. And so I have my balanced equation here. I've got iron oxide, and that is rust, and I've got aluminum as a solid. And if I were to look at the products involved, there's been a transfer of the oxygen atoms from the rust to the aluminum. And that makes alumina, and that's the source actually from which we extract aluminum on Earth. It's a mineral. Of course, I wrote it from left to right as I know it happened in the pot and as I described it to you. But you might ask yourself, why wouldn't one write it the other way? Why not have the alumina on the left side with solid iron going to iron oxide plus aluminum powder. And so a, a key question from a thermodynamic standpoint is, which way does the reaction go and, and why? Moreover, will the metal that's produced melt and how will we know? So these, these are key concepts. And the energetics of chemical reactions are just tremendously important in all sorts of chemical processes. So. Uh, for example, did you know that sulfuric acid is, by mass, the most produced chemical on Earth? Over 180 million tons of sulfuric acid are made every year. And the heat that's involved in that process has to be accounted for properly in order to build plants that can, uh, that can do the reactions necessary. Polyethylene, a very important polymer, 80 million tons of polyethylene made every year. And the thermochemistry associated with that is absolutely crucial to plant design. One can go on and on, the pharmaceutical industry, food products, petroleum cracking, biochemical processes, they all require knowledge of which way do reactions go and how much heat will it take or will be released. So focusing again on the reaction as it's written, in order to determine the direction it proceeds, we need to assess a thermochemical quantity called the enthalpy. So enthalpy is a property of a substance and we might be able to look up, these are common substances, enthalpies will be tabulated for common substances. So one can look up the enthalpy of rust, of aluminum, and when one does that, one can determine the change in enthalpy on moving from the left to the right. In this particular instance, we write from left to right because the enthalpy change is negative. That means that enthalpy is released, heat is released. We call that an exothermic reaction. This, in fact, is a very exothermic reaction. The amount of heat that's released is minus 850 kilojoules per mole. So a joule is the SI unit of energy. And during the course, there will be many opportunities to do unit conversions between units of energy. 
but 850 kilojoules would be 850,000 joules. And so the enthalpy of the reactants is substantially higher than the enthalpy of the products, and that released enthalpy as the reaction proceeds is available to do things. So what might that enthalpy do? Well, it can melt solids, and we can ask, how much enthalpy will it take to melt a solid? That's actually uh, measured by the enthalpy of fusion of a substance. So fusion is either transformation from a liquid to a solid, or the reverse is solid to a liquid. That would be melting. And in the case of iron, it takes 14 kilojoules per mole to melt one mole of iron. Uh, it takes 11 kilojoules to melt one mole of aluminum. If we look in our reaction mixture, as written, it's 2 and 2. So let's call that 2 times 14 is 28. 2 times 11 is 22. That adds to a nice round number, 50 kilojoules per mole. That leaves us 800 kilojoules per mole of remaining enthalpy that's available to do something, or 800,000 joules. And what else can it do? Well, it can raise the temperature. So the next question is, how much does the temperature go up given that amount of available energy and these substances? To answer that question, you need to know another thermochemical quantity. It's called the heat capacity. So the heat capacity tells you how much energy does it take to raise the temperature of a given substance by one degree. And so you see that in the units here, the heat capacity for iron, 25 joules per mole degree Celsius. So a rise in temperature of one degree Celsius for each 25 joules per mole of substance. And in the case of alumina, 128 joules per mole will raise it one degree Celsius. So if I add those together, I've got 153. Double that because there's, actually we'll take double of that because there are two moles of iron. So 50 plus 128, 178. Why don't we round that and say about 200? So 200 joules per mole, but there's 800,000 joules per mole still available to raise the temperature. So that's a pretty simple uh, division, and you'll get about 4,000 degrees. Now, how much is the actual temperature rise? Turns out it's a bit in excess of 2,500 degrees. And the difference just reflects that we played a little loose by assuming all of these values are constants over that entire temperature range. Turns out aluminum actually begins to vaporize if you get it hot enough, and that takes energy. But that's well above the melting point of iron, which is 1,530 degrees Celsius. And that's why we observed the iron melting, becoming a molten red flowing liquid that fell through the bottom of the flower pot. And then we saw that pretty golden, uh, golden red glowing substance lying in the sand as it re-solidified. So I'll, I'll sort of close this section by, uh, again, providing sort of a practical utility for this. Uh, it's a beautiful demonstration, and I hope you were as excited as I was doing it. But it turns out it's been used for a long time. It's, it's the method by which railroad ties are joined together when you lay track and you want to then weld it into one continuous steel track. Uh, you put, and you see here a nice little picture, you put a thermite uh, reaction on top that allows molten iron to fall onto the join between the two ties, leading to ultimately a continuous piece of steel. And so uh, that's kind of thermodynamics in real life. And uh, so I've talked about enthalpy, and I've talked about heat capacity, and we'll also start to look ultimately at terms like entropy and free energy. And that's thermodynamics, these various quantities that control things like temperature, like which direction reactions go, and we'll learn how to apply them in order to make useful predictions and to understand chemical phenomena. So that's the end of uh, this particular video. Uh, each video is going to end with the picture of the train dragging us forward down the thermochemical tracks. Uh, and the next video I want to uh, do will be called Benchmarking Thermoliteracy. And that'll tell you a little story about why it might be good for lots of people to know something about thermodynamics. See you then.